I want to introduce our preacher this morning, a very special preacher in my life. He has been my pastor ever since I was born, and the reason for that is because he's my father. And so my dad, Rick Evans, is here all the way from Alabama. Daddy, you come. And uh, thank you all for letting me have my father here to preach. And I hope uh, you'll be thankful that we chose to do this today after it's all said and done. I love you, Daddy. Thanks for preaching today. Love you, Michael, but you may be the one that's not very thankful that I came today. <laughs> I have a lot of things I could share with you about Michael, but I'll not, uh, I'll not do it. Most of those things are very good, matter of fact. His mother and I are very proud of him and very thankful for the godly young man he's become and for how God's called him into ministry and to be here with you at Riverside. It's been our joy to be with you before in worship. And what a joy it is for me to be back with you today on the eve, if I may say that, the Sunday before your new pastor will arrive. I'm so excited for you. I'm telling you, it's wonderful. Uh, Tony Lambert's a great man of God, wonderful expositor of the Word, a great pastor, and a leader, believes in reaching folks for Jesus. And I am really excited about what God has in store for you in the days ahead. I must tell you, I must be honest in a personal way, that I am right now experiencing what everybody says about being short of breath in this thin air. I guess to trip up the steps and being here and speaking out. So you bear with me if I gasp for breath every once in a while. But let me say to you, it is a joy to be with you today. God's people here in Denver, Colorado. I brought my grandson with me. I'm so thankful that little Evan could come. Evan, stand up where they can recognize you as our five-year-old grandson. And I tell you, that, that's a big man who will climb on an airplane with his grandfather and fly to Denver from Alabama and to be here with you. And I'm very proud of him. We have two grandsons. Of course, Tristan's his baby brother. And Tristan... Uh, well, Granddaddy didn't ask Tristan to come. <laughs> I figured Evan was enough for Papa on this trip, so he's back home today. I want to encourage you today. Uh, you're, in a, you're in a very wonderful, important, pivotal moment in the life of this church. As you've called the pastor that you've called, God's bringing him here to give you leadership. I want you to understand and hear me clearly that everything is about Jesus and nothing is about Tony Lambert. But Tony Lambert believes that also. And as God gave leadership to the children of Israel after the time that he used Moses and brought Joshua on the scene and how Joshua led them to new heights and to discover the things that God had promised them and led them from victory unto victory, I, I would envision you in that same spot today that God has a plan for you and he's bringing leadership to you to lead you in this new direction as God would use you to reach Denver, Colorado with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think you're going to see a lot of folks come to know Christ through the ministry and leadership of Tony Lambert. Well, let me talk to you about some things out of the Word of God today that... Uh, would be an encouragement to you if you would turn to the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, does so in, in a way that speaks to us even today. I believe the Word of God is God-breathed. I believe it is meant for every Christian, every person to hear. And I believe it is applicable today as much as it was when Paul wrote these words to the church at Ephesus concerning the things that they were dealing with. And the things that they face as a church and trying to be that infant church, sharing the good news of Jesus, trying to reach the folks at Ephesus with the gospel, and all of the obstacles that they faced in, in that trade city and a center of medical attention and, and, and that industry. But yet, he had a purpose for them and a plan. And the Apostle Paul writes a word of encouragement to them that I want to share with you today to encourage you for the future. But may I say also, this is an evangelistic message. God has a message for you. If you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, He has a word for you today. 
as we look at the dimensions of God's love. We'll be reading in just a moment, but let me share with you. I know the old song. I've sung it many times. The love of God is rich and pure, and we cannot imagine its measureless, uh, its measurements, and we'll talk about that. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. We're going to talk about that, but the Bible tells us we can know something of the dimensions of God's love that is not something that we cannot comprehend. And so we're going to talk about that today as you follow along with me as I begin reading in verse 13 of the 13th chapter of Ephesians. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. For this cause, I bow on my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, over and over, let me just stop here in parenthesis and say, Paul, over and over, reemphasized the fact that Jesus was indeed the Christ, the Son of God, God incarnate. And he just threw it in time after time, and you can easily read over that and not understand the doctrinal statement that he makes here about who Jesus is in his deity, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family on earth or in heaven and on earth is named. He says, I bow on my knees, and here's his prayer, that he would grant you, according to his riches and glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend what is, with all the saints, what is the breadth, that's the width, the length, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, Speak to our hearts this morning. Open up your word and enlighten us, enlighten us through the work of your Holy Spirit. May we understand what you're saying to us. And may we allow you to make application in our lives that we may grow and become strong for the work that is before us. Encourage us today through your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Apostle Paul says, I'm praying for you that you might be strengthened in the inner man. Now, there's a lot, of said, a lot said today about being strengthened with this physical body. You can tell that I do not run with Nicole by looking at me. You can tell that I don't go to the gym with Michael when I'm here just by me standing before you. And, but a lot is said about being in shape. Matter of fact, I hurt my knee couple of weeks ago and went to the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon, and he looked at, over the x-rays and checked my knee, and he said, well, I think we're going to be all right. Come back in a couple of weeks, and we'll decide whether or not we're going to do surgery. Well, you notice I came up the steps pretty well this morning. I'm, I'm doing good. But he said to me as he started out the door, that smart aleck, he said to me, if you take a little weight off that knee, I believe it would do a lot better. Well, he's just an ignorant old doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And I just laughed as he went on out the door, and I went home and ate some good supper that night <laughs> with dessert. But we talk about, a lot about being strengthened and being in shape. The Apostle Paul's concern was not about the physical body. Matter of fact, he laid down his body time and time again for the cause of Christ. He was persecuted in the body. He had all kinds of afflictions. But the Apostle Paul says, my concern for you as a church is not about your physical condition. It is about your spiritual condition. He says, I'm praying that you might be strengthened in the inner man. It only took me about a 30-minute stroll down 16th Street Mall yesterday to find out that you need to be strengthened in the inner man. The work is plenteous here in Denver, Colorado. There are thousands upon ten thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people 
who do, do not know Christ. And God has planted you here as a church that you may take the good news to them and share with them that they can know him in a personal way. They may be redeemed from their sinful nature and they can have a home in heaven and a relationship with God and forgiveness of every sin. You have a responsibility in Denver to deliver that message. But you will not do it outside of being strengthened in the inner man. You will not be able to do it. You will not be able to stand and, and, and do the task that God has assigned that you go into the world and share the good news of Jesus if you are not strengthened in the spiritual man to do so. And the Apostle Paul writing that understood that process and that need. And so today I encourage you that you be strengthened in your spiritual person that you may be able to do the work that God has placed you here under the leadership that he's giving to you, that you may press on and march forward and reach this city for Christ. He says, I'll tell you how you can be strengthened in the inner man. He says, first of all, you may need to make sure you have a personal relationship with the Son of God. You may need to make sure that you know him as your personal Savior. But then he says you need to know something. You may, must comprehend with all of the saints. See, he's not saying it's just a select few. It's not an elitist group that can comprehend the love of God. He says with all of the saints, it is necessary if you're going to be strengthened in the inner man that you know something of the dimensions of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, you need to know something about the breadth of it. Know something of the width of the love of God. Well, Paul understood that. Paul understood how wide the love of God was meant to be received. He understood that it was meant for everyone, that God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son. He knew it was not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he says, you need to understand something of the width of God's love. And he displayed that understanding when he talked to the young damsel who was being used as someone who could prognosticate, who could tell the future, and, and businessmen, and those who were in, in making wages and, and gambling were using her for their benefit. But she came to Paul all broken and forlorn and not knowing what her future was. And Paul told her of the faith that she could have in the Lord Jesus Christ and he could change her life. He told her, God loves you. And she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and was gloriously saved and rescued from that life that she was seemingly doomed to live. It didn't stop there. Because of his deed, because of his action in leading her to Christ, the local business guys, these men who were using her, became angered, and they insisted that they be arrested and put in jail. Paul and Silas thrown in jail. Oh, they weren't all discouraged about that. They just had a good praise service in the middle of the night. They began to pray and sing and have a good time, and, and God showed up in a powerful way and shook the place and the the, the cell doors were open and their shackles were removed and the jailer came down seeing the door ajar and was all upset that the prisoners had escaped. And Paul said, oh, don't you be worrying about that. We're not going anywhere. We're having a good time in Christ. Come on in. And he says, how can I know this Christ? How can I know this, this power that you have? How can I have this kind of an experience and, and relationship with God? And Paul told him that he had receive Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'd be saved. And the love of God is displayed and extended toward this jail, jailer at Philippi. Well, later, you remember in the book of Acts, Paul is in prison, and he stands before Agrippa, the king, and he shares of his faith in Christ. He reminds Agrippa of the Old Testament, the writings of, of Moses, and he reminds him of the promise of the Messiah. And he says, Agrippa, Jesus is the Christ. He went to the cross, nailed to the cross by you and others and our sins, but God has raised him from the dead. And Agrippa said to him, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. 
And Paul said, I would that we're not almost, but you had fully come to faith in Christ. And you see here, the love of God is so wide. It's issued to this woman, or he, he loves this woman in her condition. He loves this jailer with his responsible position. And he loves the king who reigns over all. The love of God is wide enough that it includes every person in Denver, Colorado. When you go to the workplace tomorrow morning, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're walking down 16th Street Mall, you remember that every one of those folks, everyone is included in God's love. That he extends his love to them and he gives the charge to the church in Denver to take that good news to a lost world and share the love of Christ with them. Well, he says, not only do you need to know the width of the love of God, but you need to know something of the length of the love of God. We have an issue with that. Most of us are times in our lives when we just don't know if God loves us. There are folks all over this city today that have no clue that God loves them. They consider themselves unlovable. They consider themselves as not wanted. They don't fit in. And they've turned to everything else to satisfy a need because they, no one has ever told them that God loves them. But there's times in your life, maybe in recent past, or maybe it's way back in the, the years of your life, when you felt like maybe God just didn't love you. Well, it's not really that. It's the truth of the matter is we understand how unlovable we are. You know, have you ever given a pity party and nobody shows up but you? If you ever throw one, you're the only person that will show up. And sometimes we, we feel unloved, but the fact is we feel unlovable. How long does God love you? If I were to ask you, just tell me the day in all of history when God expressed his love in the most profound way of ever. Tell me the time in history when God expressed his love more than any other day, what day would you say? The crucifixion. When God commended his love toward us in that Christ died for the ungodly. When Christ was nailed to the cross and the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth that he became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You'd say that's the day when God's love is most evident. Can I remind you that the Scripture says that that Jesus, the Jesus who was nailed to the cross, is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Before, before God ever created this place that we live in, before God ever created you, He loved you already, and He had already decided in the heart and the mind of a holy God that the Son of God would come and go to the cross. He loved you from the cross before the cross ever took place. Oh, he loves you right on. He loves you today just as much as he did the day that Jesus went to the cross. And we have a responsibility in this community to tell them of the love of God, that they haven't gone outside of the reach of the love of God. They've not made a decision that places them in a group where God does not love them anymore. But the love of God is long. He keeps on loving and loving and loving. You just go back to the Old Testament, the book of Hosea. When Hosea takes Gomer to be his bride, and she's a temple prostitute, and he brings her out of a paganism and, and marries her, and he's a preacher of the gospel the preacher of the word. He's a prophet of God. They have a child, and they name the child. They have another child. He's really doubting her faithfulness. And then they have a third child. And you know what he named the third child? Not mine. Wouldn't you like to go to school and teacher say, what's your name, boy? Not mine. Who gave you that name? My daddy. That'd be rather embarrassing, wouldn't it? But that was what his name meant. Not my child. Well, you know, she 
joined up of a group, with a group of men and went on her escapades, and Hosea came home, and she wasn't there. He asked his children, said, where's Mama? Well, Daddy, Mama says she's tired of living with a preacher. Some group of men came through town, and she remembered what she used to do, and she said to tell you she's not ever coming home. And she left, Daddy. Left us here. What did Hosea do? Well, just to make a long story short, he set out to find Gomer. He went from city to city, town after town. Hey, have y'all seen Gomer? Well, yes, she is through here with a bunch of guys the other day. She seems to be having the time of her life, Hosea. Is that, is that your wife? Yeah. Which way did they go? Well, they headed out this way, west. So there he would go. He traveled and he traveled and he traveled looking for Gomer. Finally, one day he came up on a terrible sight, one we would not like to think of, but a sight of someone being auctioned off to slavery. There was Gomer standing on the auction block. Oh, she's the last to be auctioned off. The young men who are able to work and are strong went off, were auctioned off first, and they went for a high price. And then the young women who were of childbearing age, and they could bring more slaves to the slave master. And so they went for the second highest price, and they were auctioned secondly. And then the older men, for they could give leadership to the young men, and they could be the overseers for the master. But finally, they'd bring the old women. The old women would be auctioned off. And there was Gomer standing on the auction block. No one said a word. Oh, Gomer auction, I mean, Hosea raised his hand and made a bid higher than what the young men would sell for. Everyone gasped. The auctioneer said, do I hear another bid? Is there another bid? Would someone like to raise this bid? And not a sound was heard until Hosea threw up his hand again and raised his own bid far above what any young man would have sold for. You can see Gomer standing there on an auction block, her hair matted, her skin like leather, her eyes recessed because of a life of sin and traveling around from town to town, giving herself away for a price. Don't let the preacher buy me. He'll take me home and talk about how bad I've been. <laughs> He'll preach to me. Don't let the preacher buy me. Oh, don't let him. I don't want to go with him. The auctioneer said, soul to the highest bidder. Everyone would watch what's going to take place next. Is he going to come snatch her up by the nap of her head and drag her home? Is he going to come up and whip her in front of others? Is he going to scold her? No, what did Hosea do? He went up and threw his arms around Gomer. He says, come on, honey, I love you. I'm going to take you home and take care of you. Not worth anything. Her life wasted. She's worn out. But he takes her like a new bride, and he loves her. That's how long the love of God is for you. That's how the lo long the love of God is for each of us, that patiently he waits and loves us and draws us unto himself. And in our worthless condition, as being an enemy of God, doing everything he wouldn't have us to do, Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross of Calvary and died for our sins to show God loves us. And his love is unending, his love is unconditional, and his love is undeserved. That's how long God loves us. That's how much he loves the lost of the city. That's how he much, much he loves the person that you work with that uses his name in only one way in cursing. God loves them so much in their worthless condition, in their lostness, that Jesus died for them. And his love is in no way diminished. He loves us just as much today as the day of Calvary. 
Let me quickly cover the other two dimensions. He said, not only do you need to know something of the width of the love of God and the length of the love of God, he said, but you need to know something of the depth of the love of God. How deep does it go? You may be here this morning saying, I think I've gone too low. I think I'm in a position in my life where not even God cares and he couldn't do anything for me. But oh, I want you to know, the psalmist says, though I make my bed in hell, you are there. Oh, he loves you this morning. His love is not determined by our uh, performance. It's not determined by how good we are. Matter of fact, the Bible says that our goodness is not good enough. Vance Havner once said, it's not the bad that men do that send them to hell. It's the good that's not good enough. For they're depending on their goodness, making them right with God. But oh, listen to me. God's love is not at all crippled by how low someone goes. We believe that, don't we? We believe that as Southern Baptists. That's the reason we put chaplains in prisons. That's the reason we have a chaplain on death row in Alabama. Those horrible criminals who have committed such terrible sins and broken the laws. Sentenced to death for murder. Sentenced to death for all kinds of evil deeds. And we send a messenger to say, God still loves you. I saw a young woman yesterday. Him and I took a little stroll. As I told you, we went down 16th Street Mall. He wanted to go to that souvenir shop. He wanted uh, some cowboy and Indian something. Well, he got it. <laughs> you know what grandchildren want, they get. You know, that's the reason they're called grandchildren. They're so much better than your children. <laughs> <clears throat> And really, they're, they're God's reward to you for not having killed your children. You know, they really are. And but he wanted to go, so we went. Saw a young woman. Her life wasted. Her life in shambles. The picture I saw of her was the same picture I tried to describe to you of Gomer. Gomer. Her life ruined. Her face was hollow, blank stare. She was waiting for another John, another trick. I couldn't do anything. I had Evan with me. But I thought, she thinks she's gone too far. She thinks she's too low. She thinks Jesus can't save her. But oh, the good news this morning, church, is he can and he will. He will. The love of God is wide. It's all-inclusive. The love of God is long. He never quits loving us. The love of God is deep. It reaches to the lowest person. But oh, listen to me. Be encouraged. Be strengthened in the inner man this morning by knowing that the love of God is high. Well, you need to only turn back to the second chapter of the book of Ephesians that says, where he says to us, we have been made to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Have you been there? Have you been in a heavenly place with Christ Jesus? Well, can I tell you, if you've ever been in the room where someone finally said, I want Jesus as my Savior, and you've heard someone pray that sinner's prayer that says, I know I'm a sinner, 
and I realize Jesus died on the cross for my sins and I need his forgiveness today and today I believe and I trust him as my Lord and Savior to take charge of my life, to forgive me of my sin, to give me a relationship with the Father and a home in heaven. If you've been present when someone's been saved, you've been in heavenly places. Matter of fact, you turn to the book of Hebrews. He talks about the angels of God, and, and we have an awe about angels. And matter of fact, there have been several books written about angels. Billy Graham wrote a book about angels, a good book, by the way. We're inspired by the subject of angels. But God says to us in His Word, they are ministering spirits sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. My dear brothers and sisters, that's you, that's me. They're ministering spirits, and I believe, oh, we can't see them. We, we, we have no evidence of them, but I believe they're camped out around this place today, and they're standing at attention, for this is where God's people are meant to worship, and they guard us, and they're there to minister under the heirs of salvation. That's heavenly places to know that God has given even his angels protective angels to be around us. Oh, someone asked me, have you ever been in touch with your angel? I said, no, I've been in touch with the commander of the angels. <laughs> have you ever seen your angel? No, but I've seen my Savior through the Scripture's description. Heavenly places. Oh, God's love takes us higher and higher and higher. I was in youth ministry for many years. Matter of fact, this will surprise you. I was in music ministry. Lord, help us, Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. But during my days of being in youth and music ministry, you know, it used to be a combination. We sang a little song. Says we are climbing Jacob's ladder. You remember that? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Remember that? Then what does it say? Every round goes higher, higher. Oh yeah. Listen. Every round in the love of God. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And the Apostle Paul says, church, you're living in a world that doesn't know him. You're living in a community, Ephesus. You're living in a community, Riverside, that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. And in for order for you to do the work God has called you to do, you must be strengthened in the inner man. And you're strengthening the inner man by understanding the dimensions of God's love. Oh, we live in the world of reality. I know that. Everything's not sweet. Everybody's not kind. Everybody's not fun to be around. I know. I've been trying to get in that parking place. And some smart aleck like a pull in get it right ahead of me. You know, I don't usually quote John 3, 16 at that moment. I'm not talking about those silly kind of incidences. I'm talking about everyday life, the people we meet, the folks we're around. If you're going to do the work under the leadership that our Heavenly Father has sent your way, You'll need to be strengthened in the spiritual man by knowing the dimensions of God's love. Perhaps you would say this morning, Pastor Rick, I've never encountered God's love. I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I can't be strengthened in the inner man because I have never been born again. I'm not a Christian. What well, can I say to you in closing? 
you're in that, included in that group of the width and the length and the depth and the height of the love of God. He loves you right where you are today. And he calls you unto himself. You may know him and the fullness of his love. In just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to have a hymn or song. We call it a time of decision, a time of invitation. The invitation is not mine. The invitation is not the church's. It's, it's not going to be Michael's as he comes and leads us. The invitation is issued by the Father this morning. He loves you. And he wants to strengthen you that you may be a part of what he wants to accomplish in this town. If God's speaking to your heart this morning, there are going to be pastors waiting. I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll wait here at the front. However, you need to come and respond to God's dimensions of God's love. You need to come today. If you need to know Jesus as your Savior, there'll be a counselor here. They'll be glad to sit down and talk with you and help you to know faith in Christ today. I pray that you'll do that. Let's pray together. Father, it's been a great time in your house today. We have truly worshiped, and I thank you for the way this choir has led us in worship and how we've been able to praise you and thank you through this time. But now, Lord, it's time for us to respond to your word, not to the preacher, not to the song, but to your word. As your Holy Spirit speaks to our heart, may we respond in a way that you can do a work in each of our lives. Have your way in this time today. Lord, I pray there'll be no distractions. I, I pray, Lord, that there'll be no interruptions, but that you'll have full charge to lead men and women and young people and boys and girls to surrender to your love and to grow in that love. Have your way right now in Jesus' name. Amen.